Hello, I'm Bill O'Donnell and welcome to another program on spirituality. Uh, today in the studio, I'm thrilled to have as my guest, Father Martinez Colley, who is a Trappist monk priest who spent many years here in Pecos, New Mexico when the Trappists briefly were at what is now the Benedictine Monastery in Pecos. And it's a pleasure to have you here. Welcome, Father Martinez. Thank you, Bill. That's great. Um, for those at home who don't know anything about what a Trappist monk is, can you tell us a little bit about that first, and we'll go back and hear about your life. Well, uh, Trappists are just like all the other monks, except we've gone through a long history from about the 300s. Uh, in 1098, there was a reform at a monastery called Cito, and then there was a later reform of the same group about 1660 uh, at La Trap, from which we get the name Trappist. Then in the French Revolution, uh, the monks were kicked out and uh, survived by escaping first to Switzerland and then all over the world, including the United States. And uh, in 1815, when Napoleon fell, they were all called back to France, but one man missed the boat. And he set up a little place in Nova Scotia, and they had a lot of fires. And then 1900, they moved down to um, Rhode Island. And then over the next 40 years, they uh, increased in numbers, especially immediately after the Second World War. So they needed to go someplace, and Archbishop Byrne, of recently appointed to Santa Fe, came up and um, made a retreat and asked for some contemplatives. He wanted, because he was a little scared of the Baptists coming in from Texas and stealing all his Catholics. So he first got the Carmelites of Santa Fe, then he got our wonderful twins, the Paul Clares of uh, Roswell, about whom I'm going to write a book someday <laughs> because they're so wonderful. And he also got us. So uh, uh, three or four of the men came down and took a look at a, a dude ranch at Pecos. It was called Ravelli Ranch. And they managed to buy it just before the Baptists bought it. <laughs> and um, so they, uh, then a, a few months later, in, just after Easter in 40, 1948, uh, a whole train a car of, of the monks came down from Rhode Island and got the place going. And in uh, 1952, at the beginning of the year, I came along as a 17-year-old boy from Australia and uh, just loved the place. Uh, had a few problems, but loved it. And then in 55, we moved up to, uh, to uh, Lafayette, Oregon. Yeah. It's a fabulous story. Um, I'll draw your attention. Here's the Guadalupe's Pecos Shears uh, that's available at the Benedictine Monastery in Pecos, and I'm certain you can get another copy at the Trappist Monastery in Lafayette, Oregon. And you can look in the credits to find uh, Father uh, Colley's uh, Trappist Monastery in Lafayette, Oregon. But they were only here for a few years. I think they bought the, bought the old ranch in the late 40s. And what year did they move to Oregon? 55, in 55. March of 55. We kept it secret because we didn't want to be inundated with curious people. <laughs> right, yeah. But it was a fabulous read, and now it's the home of the uh, Benedictine Monastery at, uh, at just above the village of Pecos, New Mexico. So go back a little bit, Father, to your own life and tell us grow, what it was like growing up in Australia, and how did you get the call to uh, become a monk? Sure. Uh, well, we were, have, the family's very conscious of being Western Australian, and my grandfather, great-grandfather came out in 1852 as an officer for the convicts. Uh, I was deeply impressed by my grandfather, the only one I knew, that is my mother's father, who was born in Fremantle in 1863, and who very much identified with the gold fields. The, we later had his house, which was lined with Aboriginal weapons, spears and boomerangs, and nullanullas and shields and all sorts of emus eggs. And, uh, then when he died, it was during the war, 1943, we just moved up from a little country town of Wagen, which with, with which I identified all my life. And I public, my latest book was dedicated to the nun who taught me to read down there. Um, in 43, uh, when Grandpa died, the chaplain of the hospital was a Benedictine from an old Spanish Benedictine monastery uh, 80 miles north of Perth. Later, in, uh, I, I first had felt called there, but I did not have the gift to be a missionary to the Aborigines. I don't have those gifts. And I heard about, um, uh, about the Trappists as being the ones who most loved St. Benedict and most follow, followed him most closely. 
So I looked on the map. W we were all scared that the Northern Hemisphere was just too cold for Australians. So I looked for a place that had the same latitude as Perth, and I found Santa Fe. So I wrote to Santa Fe, the, the Lord High Abbot of uh, the Trappist Monastery near Pecos, uh, in, the, in the Pecos Valley, near Santa Fe, USA. And I got no reply, of course. So I went to the, uh, to the Jesuit rector of the school, a wonderful man, and I said, I've written to these people, and they didn't answer. He said, well, which monastery? I said, well, in New Mexico. He said, did you know that uh, the abbot there is the brother of your Latin teacher? <laughs> 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 so the Latin teacher wrote, um, wrote a letter, and they, they, he wrote back, the abbot wrote back and said, look, I don't have any space, but he said, uh, maybe I could just take a couple of lay brother stalls, and I could put Adam to the choir stalls, and then you'd fit in. <laughs> so, so I fit it in. <laughs> That's an amazing story. <laughs> so it's still who you know, and even in the church. <laughs> That's wonderful. So uh, what year then did you uh, come to the United States? I came in 52. My brother, my older brother, uh, became a monk, a Benedictine monk in England in 1950. And um, I had loved St. Benedict ever since my grandfather's death. And so I, I, for a long time I, I thought perhaps I have the gifts of an engineer, so I should be an engineer. But about the age of 15, I decided, no, uh, it's really the Trappists. And so I, I, uh, uh, I, that's what it came. My, my mother came with me because I was just a kid of <laughs> Sunday. That's interesting that you should know at that early of an age that you had a monastic call. Uh, for those out there who have never been to a monastery and they're watching us now, tell us what is the life of a Trappist monk? Well, we all got up at 2 o'clock except for us... Uh, Teenagers. Two o'clock in the morning. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Because the teenagers today, some of them don't get up till two o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yes, well, they let us sleep in an hour. Um, but then there was a long uh, period of prayer there in the morning. And uh, I'm not much good at praying on my own. There were some that, that loved to pray on their own, and they're hermits now. Some of them, and they just do wonderfully. But when I'm praying with the others, it, it, it's very enjoyable. Especially when we would sing, by the end of a couple of hours of singing, um, especially if you love poetry and you love Latin and you love Gregorian chant, it was, um, it was a real experience. We had a wonderful old man, Father Morris. He was the most cultured of, the, of our the whole, whole crew. And, uh, this is at Pecos. At Pecos, yeah. And you could just feel his enjoyment, especially as we got to the Te Deum at the end. And then our abbot, who, who was a fellow Australian, uh, had a, he was deaf and he had an awful voice. But even he was enthusiastic as he read the gospel and, uh, at, the, at the end. The word, on the other hand, the, the, the silence that we had, it was, it was exaggerated. It was made by Frenchmen who expected you to take a little bit of leeway. Mm -hmm. But we Americans... Uh, <laughs> Or Anglo's, we were a bit too uh, too strict, and so we didn't balance that uh, silence with uh, appropriate communication. Uh, you know, really constructive communication. The result was that when they sent me to Rome in '57, I experienced that I was still a. I met, you know, I met boys I'd known in Australia, and they were real men, whereas I was still a 17-year-old. And others experienced, other Trappists experienced the same thing. But uh, later on, um, by God's providence, uh, I got a chance, in Rome, I got a chance to, to solve a lot of intellectual problems that had bugged me from, you know, the ghetto Catholicism of Australia. Why were you sent to Rome? Well, the Holy See came out in 55 or 56 with a decree that everyone who taught theology had to have a degree. And there's a lot more could be said about that, but it... Um, it really uh, it had more impact on us than on any other order because we had been so isolated and so self-sufficient. Um, so they sent me there, but then when I came home, they discovered that I just had no gifts for teaching. <laughs> <laughs> so and then also they were phasing out the seminary program at that time. Uh -huh. And are you still at Pecos now? Yeah, we're still talking. Oh, we're about still talking about Pecos. Okay, no, uh, by that time. By the time I, I, they sent me to Rome from, from Oregon. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So what, what did you actually do when you came to Pecos? Uh, what, you, you were obviously started as a postulate, correct? Yes. And, mm -hmm. and that lasted how long? Uh, uh, because of immigration problems, it lasted longer than usual, about uh, 
four months. Okay, and then into novitiate. Into the novitiate, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you change your name or have your name changed at that time? No, uh, they did, but I made a wee change because we have two Martins, and uh, to distinguish us, I used the Latin form Martinus. I see. All right. And then your novitiate was a year? Uh, two years. Two years. Yes. And then uh, right into permanent vows at that time? No, no. Uh, uh, simple vows, uh, three-year vows. Uh, oh. Uh, I've, I have, with the silence and also just the nature of my personality, I had um, one of my big difficulties, or I had two big difficulties. One was relating to my peers without the chance to speak. Uh, fortunately, by God's providence, in later years, I had a chance to meet the two men that were most involved in that, and they told me it was complete nonsense that they had not been the slightest bit upset with me, but. Um, we had a beautiful reconciliation, especially with one who has since died. Uh, the other was um, a real conflict of loyalty, because from the beginning I ha had had this very romantic uh, love of St. Benedict, and I expected all the talk in the monastery to be about St. Benedict, but instead it was about St. Therese, and about St. Grignon de Montfort, and about Fatima, and about you know, things which, in which I had no real introduction. And uh, that, the, the solution to that came in Rome. Uh, all my fellow students were going up to the, I was with the Jesuits, but they were going, taking courses at the uh, Benedictine University of San Anselmo. And there, there was a wonderful German uh, monk who was giving a really adult approach to St. Benedict, a really scholarly approach. So I mentioned this to my abbot that I told him out of loyalty to him, I was not going to these courses that I was so attracted to. And he said, oh, by all means, just go. Mm -hmm. so, so that transformed my, you know, from a child's yeah. romantic vision, I really got into uh, to a love of St. Benedict of a mature um, mm -hmm. scholar. And um, that went on to, uh, it also went on especially to the Gospels. Even in Pecos, we, and that was the time that Monsignor Ronald Knox's Bible came out. To try to read the, the Douay Bible and get something out of it was very difficult. Even the, the Vulgate Latin was, uh, was difficult. But Knox could give us a real, <laughs> a real understanding of what, the, what they were driving at in the Bible. What year did that come out, roughly? That came out about 48. I had not really seen it in Australia, but I uh -huh. it, uh, so the implications are that, because there's an old story that Catholics weren't Bible-oriented, and you're giving an example why, because it was a difficult translation. Yes. yes. And for instance, this New American didn't come out literally until 1970, I believe, yes. and then redone in 84. Yes. So there was but there was something about yeah. the style of, of um, Knox, you know, it, I've, I'm mainly an engineer, but I'm also a poet, and so his... Um, his style just got into me. Also, one of the first books we read at meals was The Life of Christ by Archbishop Goodyear. Now, those wonderful nuns who taught me in the little town of Wagen, it was all the sacred heart, the sacred heart, the sacred heart. And I, th I wondered how we knew anything about Christ. And, oh, it was St. Margaret Mary. She taught us, you know, she had these apparitions. I scarcely knew that you know, the, 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 the gospel. <laughs> Even nine <laughs> years of Jesuit school, I scarcely knew it. <laughs> but uh, Archbishop Goodyear, I got more mileage out of him and out of Ronnie Knox than I've got out of any book I've ever read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I want to just interrupt you here for a minute because we want to get an idea how your life developed internally, how your spiritual life developed. You said you came as an immature young man, but yes. still you already felt a call to the monastery. Yes. What happened within you in your early days at Pecos? How did you transform? What do you recall of your own spiritual growth and development? Uh, one thing I recall in particular is my novice master teaching me to read. See, Sister John in Wagen had taught me, you know, to, to read the words, but he really taught me to advert what's in the book, you know. And um, uh, I came to love the liturgy. Well, perhaps I could sum it up in one of the words of our founders of, of 1098, um, he called himself a lover of the rule and of the brethren, and he called his uh, predecessor a lover of the rule, and uh, no, his predecessor was a lover of the rule and of the brethren, and he himself was the lover of the rule and the place. And I think those three elements 
um, are essential to a really happy life in a monastery, mm -hmm. to love the place, to love the rule or the way of life, mm -hmm and uh, to love the brethren. So how long have you been a Trappist monk now? 52 years. 52 years. C as you look back at those years and you've seen men come and go, mm -hmm. what is it that, that, that all men can say about the monastic experience? How does it change you? What's the benefits to becoming a monk in your the life? The main benefit is to live with wonderful men. <laughs> yeah, w one of our men just... Fraternity, had. in a way. Yes, well, the lover of the brethren, it's, uh, we have one man there that I lived with him for 52 years. And I sometimes, uh, you know, I've written, translated a lot of medieval lives in which one person sees another transfigured. Well, that happened with old father Felix. He used to work with me in the book bindery. And uh, one day I saw him in the sacristy and I just thought, now that's Felix and he's just wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure husband and wife have that between them from time to time. But he just fits. And Brother Benedict, he was just a pleasure to be around. You know, He just, so, just made your day. Just to, to, He used to say, top of the morning, he was Irish. Mm -hmm. Top of the morning. <laughs> that's when we got permission to speak. You know? Oh, that's right. But, so how many years were you in before you got permission to speak? Well, that came gradually. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it was not well planned. We, we uh, the... Uh, what do you call it, they, they deregulated speech without really training us in communication. And w while we were silent, there was, we took it for granted that everyone thought as we thought, <laughs> you know, oh, right, and, yeah. and because we had the same liturgy, we heard the same reading. But uh, uh, as somebody said recently, uh, um, a scholar from Canada said, you know, you men at Guadalupe, you were all ordered from different catalogs. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that perfect? All right, l uh, let's go back. Take sure. us back to Pecos. Give us a bird's eye view or an insider's view. What was it like being at Pecos back in the 1950s? There was a wonderful sense of being in New Mexico, being in the mountains. And we saw the Gloriata Mesa and we wondered what was on top of it, you know. We saw the, the canyon, but we never got up the canyon. <laughs> But uh, we, uh, it was just a sense of being in a wonderful adventure, you know. We, this was this newly founded monastery, and, and the, the, you know, there seemed to be a marvelous future ahead of us. And uh, we were very happy. There was our group in the novitiate, there were 12 of us when I came. And, um, and you're all young guys too, weren't you? Yeah, we had a couple of veterans, well, several veterans. And there was a, quite a difference between the veterans and those who'd come straight from high school. So you know? guys from World War II. This is yeah. just after World War II. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they had seen combat and that sort of thing. That's right. And so they, uh, I remember our novice master made a, big, uh, made a remark once that there was a big difference. One thing you could get, you could persuade the, the younger fellows, but you couldn't persuade the veterans. <laughs> but uh, those, the... Um, yeah, we were, How many guys were there at that time, roughly? The, the total in the monastery at that time was almost 50. 50? Mm -hmm. Five zero. Five zero, yeah. Oh. yeah. The, we were about equally divided between, uh, no, uh, there were about two thirds were in the choir and about one third were lay brothers. Uh, explain the difference between being in the yeah, choir and well, lay brothers. Well, being in the choir meant that uh, there was a difference in clothing. We were white and with the black scapula and the brothers wore brown. Um, that the main difference was the uh, studies and especially the hours spent in choir. Um, all were encouraged to, to pray in private, but, and the, then the brothers would pray out at their workplace wherever they were working. Um, what type of work was going on at the monastery in well, those days? The, we only had about 50 acres of very thin soil, and um, it was the norm for a Trappist monastery to live by agriculture by raising cattle and uh, grain crops, but that was almost impossible except for the vegetable garden. We, we novices put in a great deal of time in the vegetable garden, but we also tried to develop a um, carpentry industry, making uh, church furniture especially, uh, which was doing quite well, and it did much, very, very well in Oregon for the first few years. We developed book binding. One of the monks had uh, been in seminary and had learned to bind books. It was very primitive, but that is currently our, our main income. Mm -hmm. We've developed a great deal. But I heard so much about the Trappist bread when I came here. You guys <laughs> must have had a bakery there. We did. We had a bakery. We ground our own, our own flour. Uh, we didn't grow wheat, but 
Um, yeah, it was wonderful bread, but it was only for ourselves. We did try to sell cheese. We, um, we had a few cattle, and we used to make cheese on a very small scale. Uh -huh. yeah. That's funny, because when I came here, I heard, I heard about this famous bakery, the bread that you guys Yes, made, well, so we used to give it away. We never ah. sold it. Yeah. Ah, okay, maybe that's why it was so yeah. popular. Yeah, we, we, in those <laughs> days, doctors would give us free treatment, you know. And so we don't always take a, a loaf of bread <laughs> as a gift. Ah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's great. Okay, uh, so what advice, uh, we're gonna, this is the middle of a two-part interview that we're going to do with Father Martinez, and I want to get a sense of uh, anything else that you can remember about your time at Pecos that some of the old-timers would remember. Uh, there was a good relationship with all the neighbors. Though we, individ as monks as individuals, did not have that contact. It was... Uh, it was more the superiors. One thing um, that was um, uh, that I think everyone, or almost everyone, would would rejoice in about Pecos. Well, we love the river, and you know we love the place, but especially dear old Father Morris, he was the most the most cultured of us all, and uh, he loved the birds, he loved the stars, he loved the plants. Uh, he was uh, he had had a heart attack, and so he wasn't able to get around much. But somehow, with our sign language, uh, if ever we went, went for a walk in the, you know, around the land there, we'd bring back, somehow they would communicate to him that they'd seen this kind of bird or that they'd found this kind of flower, and they'd bring him the flower. Then when we had the Corpus Christi procession with all the wonderful wildflowers uh, of the Pecos Valley there, we would make carpets of these flowers all around our little patio, and we'd carry the Blessed Sacrament around. And, and he would always record a whole list of, of those. Uh, then he was always so enthusiastic about church history and about the scriptures. And so it was just a pleasure to live with a man that so loved the life, you know. Mm -hmm. Were the locals able to participate in any way with you at the monastery? Not very much. When in um, 54, the Marian year, they brought the La Conquistadora, and uh, we sort of met the locals there at the gate when they brought the statue. And the uh, funny thing was that our, uh, being a dude ranch, there were big windows on the place where we used to eat. And so we had, we were there with our hoods and our wooden spoons and everything. And the uh, devout Baptists would come down from the Glorietta Baptist Assembly and they would be uh, outside the window looking at these strange creatures <laughs> as at a zoo. <laughs> it was a little on the embarrassing side. Oh. But the meal, as uh, for myself, I wrote a description of the meal to my parents and they sent it on to my Jesuit cousin. And uh, every monastery I've been in, the meal is just eating together with just listening to that reading. It's a tremendous experience. I was in a little monastery in Michoacan last week, and um, in Mexico. In Mexico, yeah, and they have the they do the meal the same way that we used to do it. We have a, a much more a cafeteria style kind of thing now, which is much less um, much less engaging. Uh, and uh, other monasteries, the, the, it's just those things that that really st stand out in my mind. You know, just sitting here with you, Father, I I get this real sense of joy that you. Yeah. That the, <laughs> the one advantage of being in a monastery with other men and praying. There is a sense of joy that comes yeah, through. Is that yeah. true? Yes, and uh, C.S. Lewis wrote an autobiography called Surprised by Joy. To me, it's surprised by brotherhood. You know, I was telling you about dear old Father Felix. I'd look at him in the sacristy and suddenly have this transfiguration. Of, the same way with our Father Peter, who's uh, the novice master used, used to call him the man from Minnesota, or my man from Minnesota. <laughs> He's from a big Foley, Polish family, and he just... One of his brothers told me once, you can take a boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. <laughs> <laughs> so in those days, did you guys, you, how did you live? Did you have separate uh, cells or rooms? No, we or? had, we had uh, a dormitory. Uh, it was uh, just the, the, the cellar of the old dude ranch, but they did have little partitions and then a little um, cloth curtain. Oh. So you had privacy to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah, uh, to a certain extent. You could get privacy, especially by going for a walk yeah. at, uh, down by the river or something like that. Right. But 50 men there, yeah. I mean, that's a lot of, lot of, a lot of brothers to, to, right. to be together with. Was it pretty harmonious? Because in those days you weren't speaking, correct? No, it, it was remarkably harmonious. I had that difficulty with my peers because it had al always been drilled into me. My mother, I think, was jealous of her baby sister because she was so much more successful. And so I'd been so, uh, so uh, you know, 
told that jealousy was wrong. I didn't want to be jealous of my peers, and I try, I, but I didn't know how to. Uh, so that, that was a difficulty. But the others, if you just heard the way they laughed, it was... The brothers. Yeah. It was, uh, especially the, the, the choir brothers, it was, um, it was delightful. I was, a, you know, a being from a completely different culture, from the ghetto of West Australia, it, it, there was a little bit of uh, uh, feeling a little uh, out of place. And I was, uh, my novice master often remarked that I was slower in learning to relax than the others. In fact, I, they sent, had to send me to Santa Fe one time because uh, my stomach was all upset from, from, from uh, not knowing how to relax. Mm. But the, most of those men, we had remarkable perseverance in those men. Ah, that's wonderful. And, and, uh, but uh, the novice master often remarked how what wonderful charity was the word he used existed among us. It's, oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, listen, we've only got a couple minutes left in this segment. Uh, anything else that stands out in your mind just in the last minute or two that we have left? Well, I would say that after Pecos, uh there was first a great intellectual liberation with my studies in Rome. Really getting, you know, in the Australian ghetto, we were worried about this thing that the the Protestants had all these arguments against us, and how do we answer them? And then, well, when I got to Rome, I saw that it was all nonsense. I just couldn't take Protestants seriously. I've, I'm sorry, I, I've learned to be more ecumenical since. Then. But uh, it, I just learned to love the whole history of the whole church, you know. And uh, then, but unfortunately, at that time, there was not a breakthrough on the emotional level. That came later, and then finally, uh, when they sent me to Jerusalem to do graduate studies, then I, you know, I. I really learnt of where I belonged. Sort of. mm. How old were you then? When they sent me to Jerusalem, I was about 36. I oh, think. that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right, well, listen, we've come basically to the end of this particular segment. Uh, we've had a wonderful conversation with Father Martinez Colley, a Trappist monk who spent uh, the early 50s at the Trappist Monastery in Pecos, New Mexico, which is now the Benedictine Monastery. And I want to, for those who are interested in that history, I. I can sincerely recommend the Guadalupe Pecos years um, by Father Martinez and that you can get that at the Benedictine Monastery in Pecos or look in the website of Father's current monastery in Lafayette, Oregon. Uh, so I hope you'll stick around with us and we'll, we'll talk some more with Father Martinez. So tell your friends to stay tuned and watch us next week for part two of Trappist in New Mexico. By then we're going to be on our way to Oregon. Hear some more of that and hear some of, the, some of the many books that Father Martinez has written and give you a little better insight into the Trappist life. So on behalf of Father Martinez and everybody here at uh, Spirituality TV, I'm Bill O'Donnell and enjoyed, enjoyed having you with us and I hope you'll be here next week for part two with Father Martinez calling. Mm -hmm.